So today I want to pick up. So um, again, a lot of our a lot of our our first day. Did anybody have any questions about any of the, the readings or any of the oil spill stuff so far? Is that all making sense? Is it all fairly straightforward. Yeah or nay? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, so since, since we were doing this little graphing exercise, I wanted to talk a little bit about one of the challenges that we'll encounter in terms of uh, dealing with coastal marine management issues. And that is one that we don't typically deal with here in California because we're here in California and we have a robust democracy, at least for the moment, uh, and uh, you know, rule of law and all that kind of good stuff. Um, but as we move out into, you know, beyond 200 nautical miles, we move out into the, the international waters, high seas, so-called high seas, um, we do have some challenges. And so in particular, these things can relate to oil spills. And so I wanted to just, uh, normally I, I talk about this when we get to fisheries, but we're talking about oil uh, today. So I thought, ah, we'll, we'll talk about it now. Um, okay. And this relates to this idea of flags of convenience. So before this class, has anybody heard that that term "flags of convenience" before? You guys ever hear that? Okay. So what we're talking about are the ship pulls up and it's got a flag flying on its mast or on its bow or or something, right? Back in the day, you might have seen, you know, the old uh, I don't know, you know, British privateer pirate movies, right, and stuff like that, and like the the English ship is flying the Union Jack and it's going after the bad guys and they're flying a pirate flag and they're bad guys, so they're flying a pirate flag which isn't from a country, right? And then sometimes the English people fight the Spanish people, right? And they're flying their flags and everything. So everybody flies a flag. That kinda was that way for a long time. It started changing, uh, a while ago, but it really changed in the wake of World War II. So we have these things that are so-called flags of convenience. So not flag from where you're, okay, so, so this weekend we had our first boating uh, safety class. It was great. Uh, uh, students all had learned how to drive boats and, and anchor boats and do all kinds of great stuff. As we were going through the harbor, in Channel Islands Harbor, there were some boats, and most of the boats said, blah, 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 you know, had their, had their funny names and stuff, and then it said, uh, you know, Channel Islands, or Oxnard, or Port Wainimi, or Ventura, or something like that, right? And then sometimes we'd go and we'd see a boat that said, um, you know, Marina del Rey, or San Diego, or Oakland, or something like that, right? And like, oh, okay, that, that, that guy's visiting, or, or bought his boat in that other town, and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, for the most part, though, most of the boats are there uh, representing where their, where their boat is docked, right? Again, that's the way things used to be. Um, but the reality is you can kind of do whatever you want, right? There, there, there isn't a law that says if you're at port in Port Wainimi, you have to uh, uh, say that you're from Port Wainimi, right? And that's sort of the idea here with flags of convenience. So they, so this is a, um, uh, this is the norm. This is the norm in international shipping. It's what everybody does or the vast majority of people do. So this is, this has now become the normative process. But from afar and from other disciplines, other fields, this is really weird. And this is, um, I would uh, suggest controversial. And it aids all kinds of things that are uh, maybe not above board, which is why they're done, why, why, this, why this goes on, okay? Um, and so basically what this system is, this is a, this is a system that uh, some actor, some country says, hey, do you want to fly my flag? Do you want to be a ship from my country? Okay, give me some money and you can do it. And you filled some paperwork and this and that, and maybe pay some money and this and that, and then and then you start to fly the flag of a country, and maybe that country doesn't have the same environmental laws as we have, maybe they don't have the same child labor laws as we have, maybe they don't have the same um, uh, you know safety uh, a person overboard uh, uh, life raft uh, requirements as we do, and, and things of that nature, right? 
Maybe they don't have to check if the hole is rusted um, as quick as frequently as we do in the US or in England or Japan or something like that, right? So there's all these things that you can get around. So the birth of this, uh, okay, so, 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 so this, this starts a long time ago. In the Middle Ages, in Europe, which is, the, which is the system that created this maritime law, which is why we're talking about it, right? Of course, there were different traditions in Polynesia and, and other, uh, elsewhere, but our modern system is inherited from the European system, so that's why we're talking about the Middle Ages in Europe. Okay, so uh, how it was back then, navigation in the open sea was just, you go, right? If you could do it, you get put your sail up, you go woof, 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 and, and, it, and you're out there, right? You can do whatever you want. Hello, Zach. Uh, after that period, countries start organizing more into what we would call um, modern states, modern countries, right? And as we start to do that, we start to get different laws. And this is happening at the same time that the European powers are running all over the planet, right? Sailing all around. And they're all trying to enslave people and grab resources and establish colonies and all that crap, right? Um, and so as this is happening, people are, some of these, some of these countries are starting to say, hey, I want to control the ocean. I want to control this chunk of the world, right? And so examples are the city-state of Venice basically says, hey, we're, we're in charge of the Adriatic Sea. Anybody that comes in here is going to be subject to our laws, our, our standards. Um, that's, for example, where we get the, that, that's where we get the term quarantine. We get the term quarantine, which we're all familiar with from the pandemic and things like that. Uh, uh, is an Italian word means when, when you would come into town or come into port because we didn't know what caused diseases back then. And a lot of times people would come in and they would be sick. We would make them stay for uh, a quarter, uh, whatever the hell it was, a, a, a quarantine, whatever the hell a quarantine was, I can't remember, it's, it's a, like 20 days or something, or whatever the hell it was. Anyway, it, so you had to stay on the boat for a certain number of time, a certain number of days, and then you could come off, right? So, um, so that, was the, that, that was these guys projecting their authority on what people will do as they come into their waters and, and their ocean and stuff. Uh, Portugal tried to grab the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic, parts of the Atlantic. Spain uh, grabbed the Pacific uh, and the Gulf of Mexico, right? And they started saying anybody that's going to be sailing in the Gulf of Mexico is going to follow our laws, right? Uh, and then, you know, other groups grab other places. Um, and in particular, some countries like Great Britain start to say, actually, the middle of the ocean, we control the middle of the ocean, which is a lot of huevos, right? Um, and so uh, then we get to this idea that, um, uh, you know, other than these folks trying to do power grabs, when I'm sailing on my boat and I'm a French boat, my laws are French laws, even though I might be in the middle of the ocean. So, so this place is going to follow the standards of wherever I come from, is the idea. Um, and so what that meant then was, you know, Alexander, Cass, all, you, you guys have different rules, right? So how do I know what rules to follow? So then we start to fly flags. So it becomes clear, oh, that guy is going to follow that rule. She's going to follow those rules. So we start, to, um, we start to fly a flag. And if you don't fly a flag, you're considered like a pirate or something, right? You're considered someone that's skirting the law, that, that's, that's sort of uh, obfuscating yourself. And that's considered back then bad. So the idea is you must declare who you are and, and therefore the, the traditions and customs and laws and stuff that you're going to um, follow. And if somebody comes up upon one of these vessels that's not flying a flag or a pirate flag maybe, that's like everybody consider them fair game. So hey, so they're doing something wrong and we all fly flags of our, that bear true allegiance to wherever we're from and so we're going to go you know, attack those folks. Um, uh, okay, so that sort, of, that sort of stays more or less that way until World War II. We have World War II, all kinds of bad, horrible stuff happens, and then the wake of World War II, as we've talked about so far, 
we, the Americans, decide we want to control more than just as far as a cannon shot can be shot into the water. We want to control far out, the whole continental shelf. And so we decide that the easiest rule of thumb there is 200 nautical miles. So we're going to do that because that will definitely cover everybody's continental shelf, no matter what they are. And we don't want anybody fishing in our waters. We don't any, want anybody drilling for oil in our waters. We don't want anybody, any of that kind of stuff, right? It also had the additional benefit of, in the Cold War, kind of giving you some buffer between before, before um, uh, you know, nuclear submarines with ballistic missiles came on, it gave you a little bit of protection too. That, that, that crumbled fairly quickly. So we're the big proponent of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which that's what the UNCLOS stands for. And a lot of times people will just call it CLOS or the Convention on the Law of the Sea, leave the UN part out. So this was decades in the crafting, decades in the drafting. We were the lead negotiator. We were the lead organizer. We were the lead raw, raw people. We convinced everybody to follow the rules. We, we, we pressured everybody to follow the rules. Okay, good. And then we went to ratify it, and we're one of the only countries that has not ratified the Convention on the Law of the Sea. Same thing with Biodiversity Treaty. Same thing with uh, you know just about everything we want to name. We we uh, are like, we well, this is how we want it, but then we don't ratify it in the U.S. Senate um, because we don't seem to believe in those types of things uh, in our country these days. Um, and th but that's been that way for a couple decades. That's not a new phenomenon. Okay, in particular, Article 87 of the Convention of the Law of the Sea. There's all kinds of things here, things about deep sea mining, things about fishing, all kinds of stuff. But the Article 87 is the one about freedom of movement on the high seas. And this says, again, that the open ocean is free to everyone to maneuver around. So none of this stuff from the European powers that if you don't fly a flag that, that I don't like, I can board you. It says anybody is allowed to move across the open ocean doesn't matter if you come from a coastal country or if you're in the middle, if you come from the middle of Africa or the middle of Asia or whatever, you, you still are allowed to freely navigate the open ocean. Um, and so there's all these things. So one, you can, you can navigate it in a boat, you can fly over it in an airplane, um, uh, you can put cables down on the bottom of the ocean, which historically were for telephones, now they're mostly for data transmission. Um, and to a lesser extent, power transmission from offshore uh, wind and things like that. Um, uh, you can construct artificial islands, which is one of the things the Chinese sort of claim they're doing, right? Like, oh, this is all legit. Um, and you can, do, you can do fishing and other extractions uh, as long as they're consistent with some, other, with some other guidelines. But if you're not violating anything, you can, you can go out there and, and fish. Um, and you can do scientific research and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, so when we started this, everybody got their identity for their ships navigating the world's oceans from their country. So the Americans flew an American flag, the Japanese flew a Japanese flag, etc. Well, this starts to change in the wake of, as this treaty is being negotiated and being refined and worked on and all that kind of stuff. And so it starts in the 60s and then really starts to accelerate through the 70s and 80s and now it's pretty much the norm. There's two different, there's two broad types of registration philosophies. There's nationality driven approaches. That's what we normally would think of. The Americans, so if, I, if, I'm, a sh if I'm a shipper and I'm, in, and I'm based in uh, Camarillo, I'm like, okay, I can buy a ship and then I wanna flag my ship. So I'm gonna go you know, to the um, government, I'm gonna register my vessel, Coast Guard, I'm gonna register my vessel. Okay, cool, and then I'll you know, call it an American vessel, right? That's how, that's how we tend to think of stuff. This is how most people operate is number two. So the vast majority of, of um, shipping and tankering and stuff in the world is that, and, and, and fishing for that matter. And so this is broken up into a couple different categories. They're not super important, but I'll just say that uh, centralized is run by, um, okay, so, so I'd say, so these are not necessarily the country doing it, right? It could be the country, but 
in some cases, the country is just taking a cut of the pay. The country is taking the taxes, but the country isn't doing the logistics of creating a database, writing people's name down. It's not like that, right? It would be more like, what would it be more like? It would be more like um, the NFL or something, right? So it's a, sort of a big organization with all these members and keeps track of all these people and stuff, but it's not the government, right? Government takes some, some percentage off the top, but... You know, and so they get they get benefits from these things being there, but they're not um, they're not doing the logistics. So we have some that are that are centralized in a, in a single location. Then we have others that are decentralized, and then we have a lot that are outsourced. And so um, outsourced is maybe done. Maybe somebody doesn't even live. Okay, so okay, so centralized is is these guys are in. Um, you know, they have some relationship with the central government. Decentralized. It's in the country, but it's not necessarily done by the government. Outsourced is it's probably done by somebody in London or Dubai, even though it says Liberia or the Marshall Islands. So it's just like a, a, a Grubhub or something like that. Okay, so and here's why we're talking about this, because this has to do with a lot of our resource management challenges. So flags of convenience have a lot to do with oil spills. So, um, and, and, and just release of, of pollutants and toxins into the global uh, marine environment. Ships that spill oil, ships that release toxins are almost all, not all, but the vast majority are flagged under international, uh, or flagged under countries that are, are, you know, Liberia, Marshall Islands, stuff like that, would that have a much lower safety requirement, a much lower reporting standards, a much lower uh, uh, environmental protection um, uh, a framework. The Deepwater Horizon, the drill rig, built in Texas, or built in Louisiana, uh, operate out of Texas, the company's based in Houston, it was not an American flagged vessel. It was operating under, as a, with flags of, even though it was in US waters doing the drilling, international flags of convenience. Even though the crew was mostly American, the registration is not American. Um, yeah, okay. And so what this means is, uh, now when a vessel sails into, say, Los Angeles Harbor, the Coast Guard might board them and check to make sure they're following our rules in terms of life jackets and stuff. But the, the Coast Guard can't do all the environmental checks, right? Because they're, they're only here for an hour or, or a 24-hour period, right? So they usually check the human safety things, like does the, do you have life jackets? Well, they don't usually check. But if they did check, that's what they would basically do, right? But all those other routine things. Hey, are you painting over the rust? which happens all the time. This ship should last for 20 years. Are you operating in its 35th year of operation with very little you know, maintenance, right? They're not able to check that kind of stuff. Um, and so what's going on here? So these guys are doing this because they save money. They save money, they save money, they save money. And so uh, one, it's these, so this is just like, it's the same thing as um, Hollywood, right? So we have all of our movies. All our movies used to be made here or in New York, or like, you know, 99%, you know, here in New York. And then the last couple decades, Georgia, like, hey, we want some of that. And New Orleans, hey, we want some of that. And so they create some of these incentives, right? So then it, it, in effect, it makes Hollywood movies more expensive because people could go to those cheaper locales, right? Or get a subsidy for those other things. So that's the same thing that's going here. So people are like, hey, I can, I can go to Liberia and pay way less money, A. B, they're not gonna check me and make, hold me to all these standards of things like safety and things like labor laws. That sounds good. Let's do that, right? And so that's how we get, that's how we got this system that we're, that we're in. Um, and yeah, and so, so one, there's all this it's an economic incentive for these countries like Marshall Islands and other, th other places to do this. 
And then it means that, uh, and so they also, they don't, one, they don't have the capacity to do checks for laws and standards and things like that. A, B, the standards they do have are much lower. So they, they, don't, they don't do the, the same level of inspections, but even if they did, they would be allowing stuff that we wouldn't allow, say, here or in Great Britain or, or you know, South Korea or something like that. Um, and then the other problem here is because they're not registered in the U.S., we don't know when a problem happens, we don't know what's going on. And most typically, these things are shell companies inside shell companies inside shell companies inside shell companies, sometimes 30 or 40 layers of companies. And so it, it's almost impossible to track these things down, right? And again, it's not like the FBI could say, hey, if, so if it was an American vessel, they'd go, hey, yo, Jason, give me, your, give me your records on your calibrating the engine speed or whatever the heck it was, right? And you go like, oh, God, we have to give them the records. Liberia, they don't have that. So you're not going to get that. There's no way to find that out, right? So this is all by design. So oil spills um, are more likely to happen when we have a system like this. Um, another example are sanctions. So when we're doing something, and I'll show you some examples in a second, but we have things like the Ukraine war, and people are like, oh my gosh, Russia shouldn't be invading these places. Let's pass some sanctions meaning we don't want you to sell your oil around the world. These flags of convenience make it much, much easier to sell your oil illegally around the world, right? Again, you're operating outside the typical laws and regulations of the country in question. Um, increasingly, this not only is not, is it not, it's not just, not only the flat, not only the uh, flags, but it's also the data transmission. People are now turning off the data transmission and spoofing their data transmission, so, so they're hiding electronically as well. Um, and it's, this is well known, this is, this is why North Korea exists, basically, right? Um, it exists because China allows stuff to go in over the land border, and then the water border, these guys use these flags of convenience, and they, and they, they change names all the time and stuff. Um, and then it also facilitates illegal fishing. So over-harvesting, um, uh, uh, collecting in places where you're not supposed to collect, collecting in places we, we've decided as a, as a collective whole that we shouldn't be using that fishing method. It allows you to do all that type of um, bad stuff, which is sometimes put under the moniker IUU. We haven't talked about fishing yet, but IUU, which is uh, illegal, unreported, and unregulated uh, fishing. Um, and so, you know, there's something like, you know, just between, just between this one little study period of six years, this one study found a more than a thousand large vessels. And by large vessels, I mean like, like gigantor, you know, tanker sized vessels, industrial scale fishing vessels were fishing and uh, uh, using flags of convenience to sort of hide and, and get, get around uh, restraints and constraints. Um, yeah, and then the same things, like I said before, that it's easier to hide ownership. When, when, if someone does get busted doing some illegal fishing, how, how are you going to prosecute them? Who's going on? You know, hard to find out. Um, so the scale, so by 2011, about 80% of the world's merchant vessels uh, that would be tankers, that would be cargo, uh, bulk haulers, all those things were flagged with international flags of convenience. So almost everything that comes into the port of LA is, is you know, says Liberia or Panama or, or you know, one of these sort of quote unquote kind of not really real countries uh, as far as where, where the company's based. The top three flags of convenience are Liberia, Panama, and the Marshall Islands. There's, there's some change every, every year or so, but, but these guys are, if they're not the top three this year, they're going to be the top three next year kind of thing. They're, they're the big players here. Um, the International Transportation Workers Federation said uh, in tw a couple years ago said that 42 countries had open registries, meaning 42 countries had this, um, you know, if you and I wanted to get our, regist register our guy there, we could do that you know, register our boat there. Um, and so, you know, there's all kinds of consequences. This you, you have a reduced tax base for the countries where the company is based because you're, you're not getting the taxes you otherwise would get. 
And so therefore you also have less capacity to enforce management decisions. Um, there's a much higher risk of accidents because these guys are not following the safety things. The, the, the crews are also often, not always, but, but often less skilled than on a vessel flagged by a country where the business is based. Rampant abuses and all kinds of you know, unsafe things. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a story, but I'll wait till we get to NR to get to tell you a story about that. But um, yeah, so you guys get the idea. Okay, so let's look at some, let's look at some tangible examples before we wrap this up. Uh, questions so far? Making sense? Okay, so we can talk about, for example, um, uh, Russia, right? So again, the Ukraine war, so Russia invades um, uh, two, almost two and a half years ago. Um, and one of the things we do is we impose some sanctions and we say, hey, we don't want, so, so one of the main ways that Russia was getting uh, income Russia is one of the world's major oil and gas producers. It was, it was selling gas to Europe and selling oil to people around the world. And so uh, a bunch of countries got together and we said, hey, the G7, uh, um, US, uh, um, uh, Japan, all, all these countries get together and they're like, hey, we're not going to buy oil from Russia. Okay, so now Russia's kind of screwed because all the international banking system, all the regular system that we use to sell goods and services and oil is not accessible to them. So they start uh, what we would call a dark fleet. <clears throat> and so as of a couple months ago, these guys had um, over 100 vessels now registered in the African country of Gabon, right? Like... Why, why, why? Just because they're friendly with Russia. And they're like, yeah, cool. Well, you give us some money and we'll register your vessel. Um, and so they're using these international flags of convenience to ship mostly Russian and to a lesser extent Iranian oil, which is also under sanctions, um, via mostly super, super skanky oil tankers. So the responsible people that are operating don't want to have an oil spill. So they're going to run their oil tanker for the life of the oil tanker, maybe... 20 years or something, doing routine maintenance and all that kind of good stuff. Although, if it's, if it's a international flag of convenience, it probably wouldn't be as much as you could be doing, but still there's, there's some interest. They don't want the, the, there's an economic incentive in making sure your vessel can last for 20 years, right? So there's an inherent selection pressure for you to make sure that your vessel actually works. Not for these guys. So, so, my vessel is 20 years old. What am I going to do with that? Am I going to sell it to a shipbreaker? It's going to recycle it, cut it up for parts, for metal? Or am I going to sell it to one of these bottom feeders? I'll sell it to a bottom feeder. And so that guy buys it for you know, pennies on the dollar. And they're thinking, maybe I'll get a year out of this. Maybe I'll get two years out of this. Maybe I'll get three years out of it. They're not thinking it's going to operate for 20 years. So anything you would invest, maybe some new uh, heads on the engine, maybe some new plumbing in the bathroom, like that's like, no, 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 like we're not gonna do any of that, right? And so, and so uh, this is one of those vessels on fire last year off the coast of Malaysia because it was so poorly maintained, it just, you know, had an accident. Um, and here's the, the registration of these, um, these vessels, Cook Islands, where we have worked at Cook Islands, a very, poor country, right? So that they, they look at this as a, as a money generator, right? Um, uh, you know, all these countries, relatively uh, low income where these vessels are registered. <clears throat> so when we did that, when we, when we did the uh, sanctions, um, at the time, uh, or, or what, we, what we capped, we capped Russian oil at no more than $60 um, a barrel, right? And, and so that meant that Russia couldn't make as much money. And so they're like, okay, I guess we won't sell oil. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Okay, ha, 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 ha. And then they kept pumping the oil. They still pump the oil, but they'll put it into a vessel and it's not illegal for Russia to move its oil around. So they'll put it in a Russian vessel. That Russian vessel will go out to sea and then we'll meet up with 
somebody and put that oil into another tanker. And then the nefariousness begins. And then it's hard to track stuff down. So, um, again, like I said, these guys are old. Um, The other thing is because they're operating, and this is particularly for us with oil spills, because they're operating outside the international order, they don't have all the stuff we typically have. They don't have liability insurance. They don't have oil spill insurance. They don't have all these things, right? So one of these, when one of these vessels does crack open or run aground, right? And we're like, okay, you know, Jason, like, okay, here's your bill. There's nobody to give a bill to, right? They all, one, they have all these shell companies, so they vanish and you can't find who's who. You, it's usually... Uh, impoverished folks like Indonesian or Filipino crew members that are on the boat and they get like detained by the government and these poor schmucks are like in jail and they're like who's the owner like I don't know the guy pays me in cash when we get to port and like that's all I know right so so it's that kind of thing Um, so the most recent analysis is this Russian uh, Institute that um, has identified at least 307 tankers over the six quarters of the study they looked at that were carrying Russian oil around the world. <clears throat> and the, the estimate is about 90% of this um, is, uh, is, is done by this so-called sh- the, a dark fleet or shadow fleet. I'll show you a thing in a second. Um, and, and so this is, this is you know, an example of one of these guys. Okay, so uh, one of the ways where people are using AI is to detect is pattern detection, and so that's one of the ways we've figured out what's going on with these, this Russian fleet. Um, and so uh, using unusual movements and all kinds of big data to look for patterns, and so a group called uh, Windward AI, his, um, and you guys can go check out, if you just Google windward.ai you'll, in Russian, Oil, you'll get their web page and you can play around and look at look at their data. They have a lot of pie charts, so you know, be wary. But uh, but um, and so they've broken it down into the cleared fleet. That would be what you and I would call the regular shipping fleet. That would be the right when everybody talks about and it just sails into the port and it's named whatever. And when it leaves um, Sevastopol, it's called that name. And when it gets to London, it's called that same name, etc. Okay, then we have this so-called gray fleet, which is kind of legit. So it, it's got names and stuff, but it doesn't always carry the cargo it's supposed to car- carry all the time, right? But it's not they're doing that 100% of the time. And then we have the, the, the dark fleet or the, the guys that are just all super sketch and everything there is bad and wrong. And so... Um, what we see is, and so so here we go. So this is so this is the start of the um, of the invasion of Ukraine, right? Right here, in this part in the graph, and this is time over here, and this is this is number of barrels that this AI analysis estimated is being carried per day on these different vessels. And so there's this background, and so the Gray Fleet is, you know, so Russia is sold to places like. North Korea and stuff like that. So they've been doing this for a while, right? It's not they didn't just start doing this dark fleet stuff in the wake of uh, Ukraine. They've already been doing it. And so you see, there's a little bit of this going on here. There's a little bit of this going on, right? Um, but if, what you notice is that in the wake of the of the Ukraine thing, there's a, a, some spikes up, and then people sort of figure some out, and then they kind of get slapped down, and there's kind of this this constant sort of get bigger, get caught, get bigger, get caught kind of thing. So these dark fleets are all flagged international flags of convenience, and they're not flagged by, by Russia, and the Russia claims they don't exist. So these are all... all second-hand boats? Like yeah, super skanky, old, falling apart, not well-maintained, uh, that kind of stuff. Near the end of their life, aging vessels, that kind of stuff, rusting vessels. And so what we see is that, um, yeah, that there is, that, so, so there is this background level that's, that's more or less you know, constant in the dark fleet, what we really see the pickup is in the is in the quasi legal fleet, right? So the one that 
that is maybe is known, but they're not maybe supposed to be carrying oil, or at least not supposed to be carrying Russian oil, and they're carrying Russian oil, right? But then they'll tell you, oh, this is from Bahrain, or this is this is this oil is from uh, uh, whatever Iraq or something like that, some place where it's legal to ship oil. And so I'll just walk you guys through this uh, example. And then another thing that goes on, another thing that's easier to do when, if you have an international flag of convenience, is you can also start to spoof everybody. And so, so one of the things that we've had on vessels now for some time are these transponders. So these are little things that are like, this is who I am, this is who I am, this is who I am. And so, um, so there's a couple different flavors of them, but most of them are every few minutes is sent, are sending up a signal to a satellite because these are, these are ships in the middle of the ocean, right? So they're not near a cell phone tower or, or a town. So the typical thing is they send up little mentions and this is where I am and it'll have their position and it'll have their speed and depending on what's going on, they might have a, a few other pieces of data, right? Normally, these are maintained by the shipping companies. So that helps me understand logistically. Okay, so is, is Emily about to cross the strait of whatever the heck now or no? And, and how fast is she going, right? So all this stuff is being fed. Uh, so it really helps the logistics of people. They don't have to call, they don't have to get on a radio and call Emily and say, give me a position check and where are you now? And what's the weather like, right? I, I just get it automatically, which is a great help, A. B, it helps with things like fishing vessels or people that are traversing areas that are dangerous. Because now if Emily's vessel suddenly hits an iceberg and she starts to sink, I know exactly where she was. She doesn't have to call me, I know you know, last time her vessel was functioning healthily where it was, right? So, so, so there's a lot of reasons for these transponders to have exploded in recent years. Um, but it, and it also means that you and I can access a lot of these data, um, which is pretty trippy. And so let's look at this example here um, from a little bit ago. Okay, so this is one of these Russian uh, uh, fleets. So here's this ship, and the ship looks like he's in the middle of the, uh, of the Sea of Japan, right? That's what the satellite is saying. That's what the satellite is saying. Our, our location beacon is telling us that this is where we are. So, okay, that's cool. Maybe he's supposed to be there. Maybe he's transitioning or whatever. Okay, cool. Um, and so, yeah, this guy's here, right? But if we start to zoom in, we find this, this boat called the Cathay Phoenix. And it's a crude oil tanker. Okay. But it's kind of weird because check it out. It's going, this crude oil tanker is going in circles and kind of like up, down, right, left, north, south, blah, blah, blah. It's kind of funky, which is not usually what oil tankers do in the open sea, right? So it keeps doing this, keeps doing this, keeps doing this, keeps doing this. So uh, when this group tried to go check them out, they're like, hey, let's see, like, like what's going on here? Let, let, let's go back and buy some satellite imagery and see what they're doing. There's no ship there in the water. Like, what the hell is going on? So if we zoom out, turns out that's not where the boat was. Turns out the boat is up here in Russia. So they have used a radio beacon to intercept the signal, or probably plug something in, to, to, to provide a false GPS signal. Um, and so, so it's still using the system. The system is transporting up to the satellite and reporting like normal, but the data that is going up to the satellite is incorrect. And so it turns out they're here. Um, and they're loading... Um, loading up oil to sell to China. So, they can, so, so China is not following the sanctions, right? And so China is just saying, and, and so it's great for China, because now China gets its oil, but it gets it cheap, because China's like, hey, I'm not paying you regular price of oil, because like, this is all sketch, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna you know, give you pennies on the, well, I don't know, pennies on the dollar, but like, you know, half the price, basically. And so China gets oil out of steel, Russia doesn't make as much money as it otherwise would, but it's making some money, 
because it needs money to slaughter other human beings, right? So, you know, hey, gotta, gotta get some money somewhere. And then we have, and there's all kinds of other data in the story. Um, uh, and then we have evidence of this guy at this port, including, okay, okay so, so this, this, is what, this is what the guy actually did. Shoots across. Oh, go up here. South Korea. Okay, I got, you know, going to port. And this is where it's... So so it, it doesn't go into the national waters of Japan. It sort of stays right outside. And acts like it's you know hanging out there, and in reality, it went back to Russia and was doing all the oil exchange. And we know that because uh, some guy took an Instagram photo in the harbor. And so when you look out, you can actually see this is the name of that vessel. And so this is time and date. Uh, this the social media post was time and dated. And so so we have all these ways to check this stuff, right? So um, so this was an investigative piece to show this to happen, we normally don't have those resources that we can bring to bear to do this with every single last little thing, but you guys get the idea, right? This is all grounded in um, uh, uh, faking your identity, uh, flags of international convenience, flags of convenience, and um, same thing, this is another example in Iran, same deal, right? So these guys are like, oh, I'm over here, but in reality, they're, they're in Iran uh, loading or off, uh, up, uploading or, or getting rid of oil. So this is a real concern. Now, this is, we're not going to spend much of the rest of the semester talking about this, but I just wanted to make sure you guys understand that when we get to the open ocean, there are other challenges that we face. And for all the problems that we have here in California, for all the problems with regulation and, over, and, and tax burden and bureaucracy and all that kind of stuff, we at least have the rule of law. And when we go to a situation where we don't have any rule of law, doing effective conservation, doing effective management is... Um, I wouldn't say impossible, but it's extremely, 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 extremely difficult, right? So when somebody spills oil, there's like, ah, sorry. Um, and it's a big challenge. It's a big challenge. And so, um, so there we go. Questions about that stuff? Uh, so the question is, how do, how do they specifically spoof the transponder? I'm not sure. Um, I don't know if they put like a radio interceptor over it and then transmit false data, or they, they probably hook something up. Um, that it takes the place of the, of the antenna and, and the antenna and so that it, 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 it thinks it. So, for example, uh, during the first Gulf War, some friends of mine were in the Red Sea coring uh, coral reefs. And, um, and, and uh, uh, they were in a place where they're not allowed, they weren't allowed to put permanent markers. And so they're out in the middle of the, essentially, open ocean basically, right? I mean, th there was some reefs nearby, but, but they, there w wasn't a land mass. There wasn't anything you just sight, sight by. And so they were using their, they used just a regular store-bought GPS. So this would be like the, the quality that's in your phone right now, right? So plus or minus 10 meters-ish, right? Is, is that accuracy. And so uh, that's great for when we're driving on the freeway and we're trying to navigate to Costco or something like that, right? But if you and I are trying to relocate something that's a hole smaller than this water bottle that we started yesterday, and we want to come back and then keep drilling that hole to get these, this contiguous, say, a chunk of coral history to do some historic paleoecology on this reef or something, let's say, it's, it's going to be hard. Like, how am I going to find that, right? And so what we typically do is use the GPS, and, you, and then you kind of, you know, get in the approximate area and you go down, you scoop around for a few minutes, like, oh, that looks like that thing from over there. And then you, you know, kind of, you know, do some temporary thing. And so you can do it, but it just takes a while. So they were out there in the middle of the ocean. They didn't know that the first Gulf War, so the first Gulf War started on Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday because why wouldn't you, right? Um, and so these guys were out in the, at sea. Um, there wasn't Really, um, there was, but it was, it was very expensive. So they weren't like communicating with satellites and stuff. They didn't know what was going on with the war thing. The war breaks out. Because the first Gulf War was a so-called coalition of the willing, as the first George Bush described it, um, it was Saudi Arabia and it was Israel and it was, it was uh, you know, 
uh, all kinds of countries from all around the world that didn't normally collaborate. This wasn't a NATO thing. So Willow had her GPS and um, uh, Carson had his GPS and everybody had their own GPSs, right? And, um, and so what the US government did was turn off the noise, turn off the error that they, they intentionally always introduce into GPS signals. And so these guys, and so they couldn't figure out what's going on because they went from like finding where they anchor the boat and then jump in the water and search around for like 10, 15 minutes to find the place to all of a sudden, every single time they anchor, they're right on top of their spot. They're like, what the hell? And that was because we got rid of the noise thing that we introduced, right? So you can do that with satellites, but um, so theoretically you could hack into the satellite or something and have the satellite do it, but I, I don't think that's what they're doing. I think they just sort of have a fake, uh, fake signal generator, but I don't know how the specifics work. Other questions? Cool. All right. Well, I think that's all I was going to tell you about this stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah. So then the last one is just that, um, that uh, you see why people are going to these lengths and that's because the, um, the price of oil, of Russian oil has been crashing, right? It's, it's getting less and less and less. And so as we've tightened up these, these requirements, as people are finding out about these you know, cafe, whatever the heck named ships and stuff, people are starting to go, hey, that, that's, you know, that ain't kosher, right? And so then we kind of have some additional constraints and we say, hey, don't, you know, we're not gonna allow this ship to transit through our, our, our territorial waters. And so it's kind of this constant squeezing, you know, tightening the noose kind of thing. And so this is, this is kind of where we are now, right? And so what that means is that's the, the Russia's more and more desperate, right? So they got to sell a greater volume to make the same amount of money, yeah? And so they're pushing even more and more sketch vessels and even more and more, um, you know, nighttime transfers of oil in the middle of the sea without, with all their shipping lights off. Um, and, and so there was an incident uh, a few months ago where um, somebody ran into this vessel uh, because they didn't have their transponder on, it was foggy. Now, the other vessel probably should have been monitoring their radar and stuff like that, but even so, it was clear that it was a, one of these ships that was, you know, off in Indonesian, I think it was waters or Malaysian, I can't remember where. Um, and they were, uh, they were essentially doing illegal oil transfer, right? And they were trying to hide and they were trying to keep their radio profile low. The lights are all off, all that kind of stuff. And you can imagine how that's like not good for other people transiting the, the ocean. Okay.